day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings and Changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done but Then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust Looked like explosions but it was not discussed Shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying We're all bound from heaven I'm Just sharing the truth About 9-11 Not building number Drop the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire Yet you can't see the flame Cascading projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition, but it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes The bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusions All right, welcome to Season 7, Episode 9. It's March 29th? No, 29th? Yeah, 29th. And uh, we, things are really changing quickly. We're getting a lot of information. People always say, well, why hasn't somebody come forward? Or why haven't we found this out? Nobody can keep a secret that long. If, if it was that big a deal, you know, how come we're not finding out things? Well... We are finding out things. So let's start out with uh, James Corbett with one of his eye-opener reports. And this one is about the uh, availability, really, of, of remote control for passenger airplanes. This is a good one. We'll be back in just a little while. As the mystery of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, the Boeing 777 bound for Beijing that vanished seemingly without a trace, approaches the two-week mark, the talking heads of the corporate news networks are becoming increasingly desperate to fill the 24-7 news cycle with meaningless speculation and blather. In their desperation, they have even turned to speculation on a subject long shunned as outlandish conspiracy theory by these very same networks, 
the possibility of remote control hijackings of commercial passenger jets. The latest theory is the flight could have fallen victim to the world's first cyber hijack. In an interview with the UK's Sunday Express, Dr Sally Leversley, a former Home Office scientific advisor, said she believed malicious codes triggered by a mobile phone or a USB stick could have been able to override the aircraft's security system. This could then change the plane's speed, altitude and direction by sending radio signals to its flight management system. In April last year, Hugo Tesso, a security consultant, described how aircraft hacking was possible during a lecture at a computer hacking conference. The speculation is prompted in part by a report in the Federal Register last November noting that several models of 777, including the 777-200 model used for Flight 370, were susceptible to outside attack. Question mark headlines musing about the possibility of such a cyber hijacking serve to obscure or even deny a very important point. The first such cyber hijackings most likely took place over 12 years ago, on September 11, 2001, using technology that was tested, proven, and available long before that infamous date. Although unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAV, like the Global Hawk, Predator, and Reaper drones used in the U.S.'s illegal extrajudicial assassination program are thought of as cutting-edge military hardware, UAVs of various sorts have been used since August 22, 1849, when Austria launched 200 pilotless, bomb-filled balloons on the city of Venice. Development of UAVs continued with radio-controlled drones and pilotless torpedoes developed in World War I, the creation of the U.S. Air Force's pilotless aircraft branch in 1946, the deployment of military UAVs in the Vietnam War, Israel's development of the first drone with real-time surveillance capabilities in the Yom Kippur War, and U.S. use of the technology in Grenada before the birth of the modern era with the extensive deployment of pioneer drones in the first Gulf War. When it comes to the remote control of civilian aircraft, President Bush stated in late September 2001 that he would devote federal funds to developing new technologies for combating the threat of hijacking, including remote control technology. And we will look at all kinds of technologies to make sure that our airlines are safe, and for example, including technology to enable controllers to take over distressed aircraft and land it by remote control. But even at that time, remote control technology had been successfully demonstrated for commercial jetliners for nearly two decades. This is actual footage of a joint NASA-FAA experiment conducted in 1984 at Edwards Air Force Base, in which a Boeing 720 was remote controlled through multiple takeoffs and landings before being crashed in a controlled impact demonstration. In August of 2001, this technology was further demonstrated by Raytheon, which successfully took off and landed a Boeing 727 six times at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico without a pilot on board. Raytheon also developed a sensor suite for the Air Force's Global Hawk drones, and Raytheon Network Centric Systems has recently won multiple contracts to help develop advanced communication systems for the E-4B, the U.S. government's so-called doomsday plane that was spotted above the White House shortly before the strike on the Pentagon, and which has since been confirmed was one of four functioning doomsday planes operating in the skies on that day. It appeared overhead just before 10 a.m., a a four-engine jet banking slowly in the nation's most off-limits airspace, on the White House grounds and the rooftop, a nervous scramble. About 10 minutes ago, there was a white jet circling overhead. Now, you generally don't see planes in the area over the White House. That is restricted airspace. No reason to believe that this jet was there for any nefarious purposes, but the Secret Service was very concerned, pointing up at the jet in the sky. And still today, no one will offer an official explanation of what we saw. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft and say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. Note the flag on the tail, the stripe around the fuselage, and the telltale bubble just behind the 747 cockpit area. Curiously, on 9-11 itself, Raytheon employees with ties to the company's Electronic Warfare Division, including a man described as the company's Dean of Electronic Warfare and multiple senior engineers for electronic systems, were among the listed passengers on each of the three planes that hit their targets that day. Raytheon also had an office in WTC2 on the 91st floor, 
and despite the fact that there were only four survivors from the Twin Towers who were above the impact zone at the time of the plane hits, no Raytheon employees died in the office that day. Another curious connection presents itself in Dov Zakheim, the comptroller of the Bush Pentagon and, until taking over his Pentagon role in 2001, CEO of SBC International, a subsidiary of System Planning Corporation, which provides a so-called flight termination system for the U.S. military that the company boasts provides a fully redundant turnkey range safety and test system for remote control and flight termination of airborne test vehicles. As comptroller of the Pentagon, Zakheim was responsible for the trillions of dollars that could not be accounted for in the Pentagon's books at the time of 9-11, and which prompted Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld to declare a war on bureaucracy on September 10, 2001. Pentagon, the day before 9-1-1, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war, not on foreign terrorists. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. He said money wasted by the military poses a serious threat. In fact, it could be said that it's a matter of life and death. Rumsfeld promised change, but the next day, the world changed. And in the rush to fund the war on terrorism, the war on waste seems to have been forgotten. My 03 budget calls for more than... $48 $48 billion in new defense spending. More money for the Pentagon when its own auditors admit the military cannot account for 25% of what it already spends. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. Flight 77 was supposedly piloted by Hani Honjur, a flight school dropout who could not handle a Cessna 172, but somehow managed to steer a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn at 500 miles per hour to come exactly level with the ground. Neither experienced pilots nor aviation officials could believe that such a move could be pulled off with such precision at such high speeds by any but the most experienced pilot. Watching the flight on her radar screen, Dulles International Airport air traffic controller later remarked, The speed, the maneuverability, the way that he turned, we all thought in the radar room, all of us experienced air traffic controllers, that that was a military plane. By what we are expected to believe is a massive coincidence, the flight ended up hitting the Pentagon in the budget analyst office where the DOD staffers overseen by Zakheim were working on the question of the missing trillions. This is a picture of the location of the victims of the Pentagon attack that was released as part of the prosecution exhibits at the trial of Zacharias Musawi. It depicts the offices that were destroyed in the attack, including the Office of Resource Services Washington, a team of 65 civilian accountants, bookkeepers, and budget analysts, 34 of whom died on September 11, 2001. As a Pittsburgh Post-Gazette article of December 20, 2001 noted, Robert Jaworski, the director of the office, was faced with the task of choosing which of his colleagues' funerals he would attend because he could not physically attend them all. The office's role in processing information regarding the unaccounted for $2.3 trillion has never been established by outside researchers and in fact has never even been inquired into by professional journalists. An Arlington County After Action report on the rescue and cleanup response at the Pentagon, however, notes that, quote, it was also the end of the fiscal year and important budget information was in the damaged area. As 9-11 researcher Aidan Monaghan told the Corbett Report in 2011, the remote control hypothesis also makes sense of various anomalies in the flight path of United 175 that hit World Trade Center 2. Well, there are many video clips of uh, United Airlines Flight 175 striking World Trade Center Building 2 on September 11. And there was one in particular I noticed when looking around at different clips that captures most of the last 13 seconds of the flight of United 175 as it approached World Trade Center 2. And in fact, it does capture virtually all of the last eight seconds. And what I noticed during this clip was as the the plane approached, and the angle of the camera was such that you could actually see the angle of the, uh, the the bank angle of the aircraft with respect to its location, uh, with respect to the building as it was approaching. It just was a very ideal, almost type of shot. And uh, what one can notice is that uh, the plane uh, begins its banked twenty degree turn about a mile and a half from the building, 
and without correction would have been able to strike the building from that distance, which is, in my opinion, a, a rather remarkable feat for an untrained pilot. What it does require is the precise coordination of at least two factors, the selection of a correct bank angle from the given location from where you are making this turn and also traveling at a rate of 799 feet per second, the initiation of this turn at the precisely correct time. Because the turn that we observe, had it began, had it started rather a second sooner even or later than observed, means the plane misses the building by 799 feet necessarily. And in my view, possibly suggested the role of uh, flight control computers or other avionics and autopilot systems as opposed to the unproven allegation of hijacker pilots in control of these airplanes. As incredible as such a narrative is to the general public, that incredibility stems largely from the media's steadfast refusal to report on the proven technologies to accomplish such a cyber hijacking that have been available for well over a decade. Whether or not Flight 370 was the victim of such an attack, or something different altogether, remains to be seen. But the many pieces of the 9-11 puzzle pointing to the use of remote control technologies to pilot the flights on that fateful day, from Raytheon's test flights of remote-controlled passenger jets, to Zakheim's involvement with a company responsible for remote control flight termination systems, to the precision of United 175's bank angle and turn start time, to the presence of the E-4B doomsday planes in the skies that morning, provide a compelling counter-narrative to the tabloid press's claim that Flight 370 may be the first example of cyber hijacking. One other piece of that puzzle provides yet further credence to the claim of remote control planes on 9-11. In a story so bizarre that it simply cannot be shoehorned into the official 9-11 story, and thus has been ignored, police officers stopped a strange van near their temporary command post next to the still-smoldering Twin Towers while the chaos unfolded on the morning of 9-11. According to the official report of the Mineta Transportation Institute, there were continuing moments of alarm. A panel truck with a painting of a plane flying into the World Trade Center was stopped near the temporary command post. It proved to be rented to a group of ethnic Middle Eastern people who did not speak English. Fearing that it might be a truck bomb, the NYPD immediately evacuated the area, called out the bomb squad, and detained the occupants until a thorough search was made. The vehicle was found to be an innocent delivery truck. No explanation of who these men were or why they had a picture of a remote-controlled jet flying into the World Trade Center painted on their delivery van on the morning of 9-11 have ever been provided, much less even asked for by the complacent, complicit mainstream media. If and when more details of the missing Malaysian Airlines flight do eventually surface, don't expect the media to do any better job answering questions about it or connecting any of the 9-11 dots in what may very well have been the world's first cyber hijacking nearly 13 years ago. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other... All right. Well, he was cutting off the ad, but I don't mind people getting an ad for BoilingFrogs.com. That's Sabelle Edmonds' post uh, or website, and uh, she deserves all the support she can get. Anyway, 100% cool lady, I think. So, um, well, isn't that interesting? James Corbett makes a wonderful analysis. Um, but we've got another good thing coming up. There's been, we've always talked about insider trading, and, and everybody knows about the put options, the tremendous rise in put options, way above the average, uh, statistically 99.99% chance of insider trading but 
nobody ever really started pointing fingers at who was doing it. We kind of knew what companies were doing it, but uh, well, Max Kaiser is going to fill us in on the details on this uh, about the CIA's foreknowledge of 9-11. So let her rip. This is on Alex Jones. We are joined now by Max Kaiser of MaxKaiser.com, and I appreciate him coming on. He's also a filmmaker. We had George Galloway on last week. He's doing two films with I'm going to get him on when they come here to the U.S. when we get both men in studio. But, Max, so much is happening. I want to get into the developments in the economy. I want to get into the suicide bankers. That I mean, the numbers are so high now, I can't even keep track of it. I know it's over 20 for a while. Uh, and finally, Bloomberg saying coroners are now looking into it. Uh, but but before we do that, what is front and center on your radar screen? Hi, Alex. Uh, do you want the bombshell now or later? Just give me the bombshell now. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I've been tracking uh, this work of the 9-11 insider trading for quite a number of years. And I, last time I was on your show, I told you there was a book coming out that would confirm that the CIA knew about insider trading and leading up to the 9-11. That book is now going to be available for the public on April 3rd. The book is called The Death of Money. And chapter one explains and explores the CIA uh, completely aware of insider trading in the days leading up to the 9-11 attacks. Uh, I had the author on my show. My show will be broadcast in a few days. And we also revealed a bombshell that the brokers at Cantor Fitzgerald were trading on insider information on the attacks on themselves. Uh, that's now been confirmed. Uh, it's discussed on my show. It'll be aired on Kaiser Report in a few days. And this book called The Death of Money by Jim Rickards uh, explains in great detail he is an eyewitness who was there in the room while the CIA was monitoring insider trading on the airline options leading up to the days leading up to 9-11. I'm here to confirm that the CIA was trading on insider information against the deaths of many Americans on that day. And I'm here to confirm that Cantor Fitzgerald was also trading on those options against themselves. To talk about suicide bankers, Alex, these bankers were trading on their own death. So is it any surprise now that so many bankers are committing suicide? Uh, they're, they're psychopaths. Uh, we saw it on 9-11. We see it uh, on every day on Wall Street. Bankers committing financial terrorism. They trade on their own death. They trade on other brokers' death. You know, Max Kaiser, I've got to stop you. This is bombshell. I didn't know that you would break this here today. I want to just stop you. We're going to have to do a nightly news piece on this tonight and, and, and pull out all the original articles because I covered it at the time. It came out in the major German papers and British papers in the week after 9-11 that Buzzy Krongard, executive director of the CIA, I guess that was number three at the CIA, uh, an administrative position overseeing the agency itself, he was involved in the insider trading, and we know it was tied to counter Fitzgerald back then, but then it got shut down. Record put options, not against the airline industry, but against United and American specifically, and that that was then covered up and may have run into the billions, but that got shut down very quickly. If you have an eyewitness inside there that actually saw it happening, it proves prior knowledge. And it, 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 is, it is the smoking gun of 9-11. Uh, Jim Rickards, who writes this book, The Death of Money, which you can order it now. It's a follow-up to his international bestseller, Currency Wars. He's, a, he's with the intelligence services. He also no, I know who he is. I want you to get him on the show. I've asked you to get him on. I want him on. Yeah, he, well, um, so he he's in the room. He provides eyewitness account of um, the 9-11 options trading, and um, he it explains every, all the dimensions that are associated with that 9-11 insider trading. I My contribution to the story is, and I've hinted at it before. Sensational. But, now, but this book that's come out, I can say now, because I have some uh, support with this book, is that I was talking to Cantor Fitzgerald brokers in, on the days leading up to 9-11. No, no, so, you sold them the virtual trading software. Yes, they bought my company, and I was talking to them directly, and they were saying, uh, they were talking about trading on this information about these explosions and airplanes and hitting New York City, 
and uh, now we've got confirmation. That, so some of those people died trading against themselves. Some of those people are trading on their own deaths, and they're now dead. Well, uh, let's that, break that, this down. Know, when does your, your, uh, your RT show airs on Friday, right? Uh, April 3rd, I believe that show is aired. Well, I know it re-airs because I, I get confused on the dates. Yeah, I want to get you on as soon as that airs so we can actually air that interview here and get follow-up analysis. But break down what a put option is for folks that aren't in the stock market or don't study it and, and why this is such a big deal. The stocks uh, are trade on the New York Stock Exchange and stocks trade on companies like airlines. And in this case, you're talking about United Airlines and American Airlines. At the same time, in Chicago, there's an options exchange. And an option allows you to put up for a very little amount of money an option to buy or sell that stock at some point in the future. And the reason why the option market is interesting, and I traded options on Wall Street for years. I was the, I think, number two or number three highest producing options broker within the Sherson Lehman Hutton system. I did over a million dollars in gross commissions in options in 1988, uh, just trading options. Uh, and I was in there, it's very select group of- No, no, you were even on things like Nightline and stuff back in the 80s. We found those clips, it's pretty funny. I, I, you know, so I, I, I've made my career trading options. It looks like options a- are Go ahead. They're very, very, yeah, they're very, very, very sensitive to news events. When any information hits the tape in, in the market, it, you'll see it in the options market first because it's the most highly leveraged market there is. So you see, it, it, it's almost like a, um, you know, a thermometer or a barometer. It tells you events that are about to happen. It's where people trade first before they trade anywhere else. So, in the case of 9/11, you saw options trading as if airplanes had exploded on these airline stocks before the airplanes exploded because the people that were trading them in the days leading up to the event knew about what was coming and they were trading on inside information and so the options market is like um, you know a litmus test or it gives you a photo of what the insiders are doing and uh, Jim Rickards in his book talks about how he built a system called Markent that's M-A-R-K-I-N-T short for market intelligence which was based on creating an options detection program for the CIA to track terrorism and other activities using the options market, which is based on my technology, the virtual specials technology, going back to the mid-90s. So also, remember, John Poindexter created the PAM, which is the policy analysis market, was an attempt to create a terror futures market to try to figure out where terrorism would hit next. That's also based on my technology. So here you have the options trading. I was talking to the Canner broker uh, in the days leading up to this event because they had just bought my company. They moved it to the top floor of the World Trade Center, and they're buying these options and trading. I then talked to my friends at Alex Brown, where I also worked as a broker. I worked under Buzzy Krongard. They also heard the story coming out of New York. They were also buying these options. The globalists have controlled the mainstream media for a long time. Ta-da! Okay, I'm always back. Johnny on the spot. What this is, is uh, we've got a commercial and we have to comply with cable access rules. We're skipping past the commercial and we'll be right back. But uh, it's just amazing to see how much information we really do have. Now, the problem is that the prosecutors are the culprits themselves. We can't expect them to prosecute themselves. So, all right, well, we're ready for the second half. Here we go. slash 11 you'll get the asia times the new york times german newspapers the best site is uh, 911 research.wtc7.net they've got a whole compendium usa today clippings profit from loss uh, stocks of united and american airlines fell sharply following the september 11th attacks which had used hijacked jets from two airlines but unknown investors made a bundle using a financial derivative that increased the value when a stock went down. And there is the map, source Yahoo Finance, also USA Today. They have some of those graphs on there. And you can read literally dozens of newspapers about this. But when it came out that it was the executive director of the CIA through the company that Max Kaiser was working for, and of course Max has been talking about it since it happened, uh, and then now he's got an insider who says he was there witnessing it. Again, I know who the gentleman is you're talking about. Max Kaiser, an investigative journalist now. Tell us about the gentleman and exactly what he said and what's coming out on your next uh, special report on RT. This is, this is huge because we know this all went on. They got caught. Nobody got in trouble. Uh, there was some other insider trading by people, but they ended up going to jail, but never in a question of how did they know that was going to happen in New York.
that was to shut people up. Uh, but uh, the CIA folks were allowed to profit from this. I mean, this shows absolute prior knowledge, bare minimum, and that they all lied to Congress. Go ahead, uh, Max Kaiser. All right. So the book is called Death of Money. The author is Jim Rickards. He wrote the Currency Wars book, which is a bestseller. And he's very closely associated with the CIA. He runs war games for the CIA where they play uh, currency war games, where they use financial derivatives to fight each other in the futures markets. So China, Russia, America, Iran, they're equipped with financial futures and they try to destabilize each other's economy in the financial markets, this financial war. And he's very close in advising the Pentagon and the CIA. And he's our main go-to guy. He was also uh, negotiated a hostage release out of Iran back when there was uh, during the uh, 79 crisis. Uh, he's also been involved in the bailout of long-term capital management uh, when it went bust uh, back in the early 1990 period. Uh, so this guy is a very plugged in guy, uh, very close to the government, very close to the intelligence agency. The couple of points he makes, the 9-11 report is false because the 9-11 report, he says, says that there wasn't really a significant amount of insider trading or that the markets were not reflecting insider trading and that there's not not a lot of meat to that bone. He says that's completely false. There's a He was there and he saw the information, eyewitness, and he gives you an eyewitness account of insider trading. He says there was unquestionably insider trading. He himself distances the idea of the CIA trading on this information. My addition to this conversation is to tell you that based on my having worked with Buzzy Krongard at Alex Brown and having talked to the brokers at Cantor Fitzgerald and the brokers at Alex Brown leading up to this event that they were trading on this inside information. So that, those are my conversations that I had. Now, there was $5 million left in the Alex Brown account that was never collected from uh, brokers and bankers who were trading on this information who died on the event. So instead of escaping, instead of leaving the building and saving their lives, they stayed behind to trade options on airlines and they died, but they died with $5 million left in those accounts. Those, that money was never collected. And that gives you an insight into the mindset of the average stockbroker on Wall Street. They're pathologically ill. They'll trade options until they kill themselves. And of course, they kill a lot of people that day and they contributed mightily to the events leading up to those events. And so this book coming out it's coming i think it's hitting the stands for sale a week from today april 3rd i believe that very exciting we're going to get him on and give us the contact info if you want to help us expedite that max i want to get you on together maybe have him on for 30 minutes then have it lap over with you uh, overlap so we could get some deep analysis on this but this is something i've studied deeply and so i know how true everything you're saying is plus we're putting mainstream news articles on screen while you're saying it People say something like 9-11, if it was an inside job, it would come out. It has come out. Sibel Edmonds, the, the NSA uh, translator for the FBI, all these other witnesses, six of the 10 9-11 commissioners say the whole thing's a fraud, that the official report wasn't even written by them. Uh, it is just a giant, stinking pile of lies. It's now come out on Zero Hedge, more video of the rebels bragging they staged false flags against Assad. The UN well, even now admits that. Yeah. I mean, their, their whole. Well, let's, let's, yeah, let, let's let's point out a couple of things. I mean, the the trading on the 9/11 events were, in my view, were done by insiders that didn't know, they, they weren't necessarily responsible for the those events. They just knew they about it. They could have stopped them. They knew about it. They could have stopped them. They knew about it in time to have stopped those events. Well, that makes you an but accomplice. If I know my neighbor's going to kill his wife and I don't do anything, I'm an accomplice. Yeah. I, I don't think that's uh, that wasn't going to be a full-blown ad, but we'll come right back and we'll hear some more of that. We're just trying to comply with cable access rules, but uh, it, it's funny because nobody's really going to try to make any money off of my video. It, is, it looks like we're ready to rock. <laughs> Kaiser, your comments on that. We're going to have you back on soon about the insider trading and where this is going. And then the whole world markets, uh, what's uh, coming in the future. 
uh, the Syria situation, the Ukraine situation. I want to get your take on it all, so so walk through it. But what do you think about the global awakening we're seeing? I, I mean, you I didn't, really did you uh, see the Coke can in here? It more accurately than I was five years ago. Is that what ago. you switched back for? Well, as you know, uh, we are coming to see That's you in Austin, here, Alex, myself, uh, George Galloway. We're traveling to Austin. We're going to come and see you. Because uh, we're making this film, making a couple of films. One film we're making right now that you're in is called Bailout 2, which is the sequel to Bailout. So I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign on Max, uh, my new crowdfunding site called Start Join. Uh, I sent you over the uh, page. And we're going to raise 150,000 uh, pounds for this project over the next couple of months. And we're going to shoot this all over Europe, which is the se it's the sequel to Bailout, the first film that did very, very well. Sean Fahey is the director. And uh, as part of this project, George Galloway, myself, a few others, we're all uh, Roseanne Barr is in this project also. We're all going to travel to Austin this summer uh, to be on your show live. But as we get into that, I want to get your hopefully your listeners to participate in this crowdfunding effort. I don't know. I don't think you've done a crowdfunded film ever over there on InfoWars, so I'm hoping that you, uh, this will be the Well, what I really want to see get made is the Where's Kenny Boy, because we know he's still alive. Yeah, well, the second, when we get to Austin, we're going to launch Where's Kenny Boy, which is another film right in your studio, because we're going to go right from your studio down to Paraguay to begin principal photography on Where's Kenny Boy. But before that film begins, the lead up to that film is this film called Bailout 2 that you that you're featuring in the director should show up soon to get some preliminary footage from you. Yeah, he said he's coming to Austin, yeah. Yeah, I want to get your listeners to participate in this crowdfunding effort, and I'm hoping you will also. And as I said, I don't think you've done a crowdfunding film before, but it is a revolutionary way to raise money for projects. Uh, we've also are going to an, what I believe is going to be a, a game changer for the global freedom movement, if you want to call it, and that is with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, like my own currency, MaxCoin, and others where you see now whole nations like Iceland and Spain uh, and Scotland are introducing their own cryptocurrencies created by individuals to give, them, to give the people economic freedom and economic self-determination. Uh, right in under the noses of the new world order. There is just a mass exodus away from the system, and people in the system I'm seeing are waking up even faster than the public. Uh, I mean, That's I'm, right. I, when you combine crowdfunding with cryptocurrencies, like we're doing with StartJoin, and we're doing with Bailout 2, which is crowdfunding, and you can also use uh, Bitcoin as soon as it reaches 100% of its budget, uh, you, you're introducing ways for the world to create their own economic reality completely outside of the central banks, completely outside of the state, completely outside of the banksters on Wall Street, the people who bet on their own death at 9-11. You don't want to be in bed with people betting on their own death. Uh, that's not the way to build an economic sustainable Well, Max, economy. that's my next point is that – 50 to 1, 40 to 1 bets with John Corzine gets away with it. It is these crazy Wall Street banksters who are the opposite of free market because they have us bailing them out over and over again. Uh, so their losses are protected. They're the ones running the war against Russia. I, I want to get, because I know you're close to this, you're in Europe. What do you think about the Ukraine situation and what's unfolding there? Well, just quickly, let me give you another example of options in 9-11. After the 9-11 attacks, the stock market crashed. And then companies like Apple and Steve Jobs were, were resetting his corporate stock options at the lower price so that he was, he'd be able to cash in on the victims of 9-11. And a lot of technology companies did exactly that. They, they stretched, if not broke, securities laws by repricing options so they could make hundreds of millions of dollars again on that tragedy. So you had CIA trading on inside information leading up to the tragedy. Then you had people like Steve Jobs and Apple Computer and insiders resetting options contracts after the tragedy. So those people, those poor people, those poor 3,000 people, they were raped, murdered, and bludgeoned by their own citizens in the financial markets even before the plane showed up. They had already been raped horribly by the CIA. You know, that's the, that's the tragedy of it all. They got raped twice that day, once by the CIA and then once by the hijackers, again, by the hijackers. But uh, if you want to talk about the Ukraine situation, uh, what you have, and I think one of your guests who expresses this brilliantly is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts. As he says, there are three countries right now that are outside of the Federal Reserve banking system, China, Russia, Iran. And what we see now is the end game 
for American empire. The American dollar as world reserve currency, the game plan has been to invade lots of countries and fail. And as you fail, you simply double down by printing more money. In betting circles in the Las Vegas, this would be called the Martingale betting system. And you can look this up online if you type in Martingale betting system. It's a way that gamblers attempt to beat the house by doubling down on losing bets. If you're at the roulette wheel and you bet red, it comes up black. You keep betting red until eventually you either A, run out of money, or B, you win. Americans' foreign policy is a martingale betting system of foreign policy. They've, they failed in Iraq. They failed in Afghanistan. They failed in Libya. So they're going to use this failing strategy now to try to go into Ukraine. Remember, it's America and NATO trying to get into Ukraine, and by putting in that puppet regime of neo-Nazis, that sparked the Crimean people to seek self-determination. And, of course, they held a referendum, and they voted to be a self-determinant, and Russia said, yeah, fine, whatever, here's some passports, you can be part of Russia. Now the U.S. is faced with a conundrum, because if Russia is not going to fold like a house of cards like Libya did or like Iraq did, and they're actually going to put up an economic um, firewall against this unbelievably corrupt U.S. dollar hege hegemony, then the U.S. dollar is at risk of collapsing unbelievably. And the gold and silver, of course, as we've been saying for a number of years, is the currency that Russia and China have been accumulating by thousands and thousands and thousands of tons over the past five to ten years, waiting for this very moment. So now we're at the final OK Corral showdown, gold versus the dollar. And uh, you saw last week the dollar was very weak. Then the U.S. started their anti-Russia propaganda campaign to try to get people to buy the dollars again. I think they're just not going to work this time. And gold is going to do very well. Bitcoin, of course, is emerging in the crypto space. Maxcoin, which is my currency, has got a lot of traction right now. It's worth $3 million. It's going to be worth $20 million here in the next few weeks. You can buy crypto. Yeah, I would just say, you know, you, that's something you can go look up yourself about this new currency, the Bitcoin and all that jazz. And But we're, we're really trying to concentrate on 9-11 and things that were directly re a result of that, like Patriot Act or whatever. Um, many of you have gone to the internet and maybe even watched YouTube videos and then in the comment section below you make a comment about something. Maybe, maybe you give some irrefutable facts about the hard evidence, you know, like the David Chandler video that we made points out, you know, the, the, the fact that there was free fall and the way the towers fell and all that. Uh, then the, the fact that there was uh, nanothermite discovered. You, you know, you make these points that are actually irrefutable and somebody will argue with you bitterly. And you'll notice that no matter how much energy you put into it to explain it, you can't get your message across. And the reason is that you've experienced the Cass Sunstein type of uh, shill, a government shill or a, or a corporate paid liar, either one, that are actively uh, invading 9-11 websites and things like that to try to disrupt it. And they, they try to waste your time with tremendous amounts of trivial arguments and ridiculous arguments, but there's a key way to spot them. They, one, never, ever stop coming back. I mean, they will return with some argument about something, no matter what you say. That's one. And number two, no matter what point you make, even if you were just saying, well, we all breathe air, don't we? They would argue against that. That's the rule. Never accept any point you make and never stop. So those are the way you tell about the government shills. Well, Cass Sunstein, the wonderful person who thought all that up, put out another book. So we're going to uh, listen to James Corbett again, and he's going to talk about, uh, well, this is confronting cognitive dissonance, which is a term first invented by Cass Sunstein. So let her roll. This is a good one. Have you or a loved one ever found yourself saying something like this? Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Or this? 
Yeah, come on. Yeah, 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 listen, listen, there has never been a conspiracy in this country. Or this. And conspiracy theories are bullshit. Then you might be suffering from cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance? What's that? The theory of cognitive dissonance was first posited by American social psychologist Leon Festinger in 1957 to explain the discomfort and mental stress that we feel when our beliefs, ideals, or values don't match up to reality. Festinger's theory states that when people are in a state of dissonance, that is, when their beliefs or values don't match up with their behavior or experiences, they will adjust those beliefs or values, or even adjust their perception of reality, in order to achieve consonance. Furthermore, Fessinger showed that people will actively avoid situations or information that might challenge those beliefs and values in order to avoid dissonance. This theory helps us to understand how someone can both deny and admit the existence of a conspiracy in the very same breath. I don't believe in this notion of some sort of secret societies controlling people. But, of course, in any political system, there are sort of over-the-table and under-the-table arrangements. Or how someone can argue for and against the idea that the owner of a publication is essential in determining what its reporters can or can't talk about. I, I think it's relevant who owns Salon, and I think it's relevant who owns, you know, any journalistic outlet, and the reason for that is obvious, that employees who work... The, the, the reason is because people who work for companies know who signs their paychecks, and know that the work they do ought to be pleasing to the people who sign their paychecks. Uh, let's talk about The Intercept. Glenn, talk about the launching of this new website today, together with Jeremy and Laura, what you're doing with The Intercept, what your plans are. Sure. So, you know, it was only, I think, four months ago or so that we first had conversations with Piero Midiar, who is the uh, publisher of the site through First Look Media, about working together. Jeremy, Laura, and I were off in one corner planning our own media site, and he was off in another planning his, and we realized that we could work together effectively. Or how someone who claims to have studied an institution can deny that it was the product of a conspiracy that was admitted to by its conspirators. Is the Federal Reserve a conspiracy theory? A lot of people in Washington are starting to believe that. I don't think so. It's a long-standing institution that's designed to stabilize the economy, and whether it mis makes mistakes or not, works or not, it's, uh, it's not a conspiracy. Secrecy was so tight that all seven primary participants were cautioned to use only first names to prevent servants from learning their identities. Years later, one participant, Frank Vanderlip, president of National City Bank of New York and a representative of the Rockefeller family confirmed the Jekyll Island trip in a February 9th, 1935 edition of the Saturday Evening Post. I was as secretive, indeed as furtive as any conspirator. Discovery we knew simply must not happen or else all our time and effort would be wasted. If it were to be exposed that our particular group had got together and written a banking bill, that bill would have no chance whatever of passage by Congress. Or how someone can claim that if 9-11 had been an inside job, it would be the greatest event in the history of American politics, and simultaneously an event of no significance whatsoever. Uh, did they plan it in any way or know anything about it? This seems to me extremely unlikely. I mean, for one thing, they would have had been insane to try anything like that. Uh, for, if, if they had, it's almost certain that it would have leaked. You know, it's a very poor system. Secrets are very hard to keep. So something would have leaked out very likely. And if it had, they'd all have been before firing squads, and that would be the end of the Republican Party forever. You know? And it just, it just doesn't make any... I mean, even if we're true, which is extremely unlikely, who cares? You know? I mean, it doesn't have any significance. Indeed, 9-11 represents one of the greatest examples of cognitive dissonance in our own era. The public was so traumatized by the reporting of the events of that day that they have become emotionally invested in believing in the official account of those events. Um, and about a week later, I read a lengthy article by Professor Griffin um, about why he believes the official account of 9-11 cannot be true. 
and it was a very well-researched article. I was in my office at the time. I sat there and I felt my stomach churning. I thought maybe I was going to be sick. And I leaped out of my chair and ran out the door and took a, a long walk around the block, around several blocks, um, and just broke down. I understand now that what was happening was my worldview about my government being in some way my protector, almost like a parent had been dashed and uh, it was like being cast out into the wilderness I think is the closest way to describe that feeling and I sobbed and I sobbed felt like the ground had completely disappeared beneath my feet and and I knew at some point during the walk that I knew that I was going to have to become active in educating other people about this that there was that for me to retain any sense of integrity, I was going to have to take some action. I couldn't just let something like this go. When confronted on this subject, victims of cognitive dissonance will often become abusive and angry, lashing out verbally. 9-11 was not an inside job. It was an Osama bin Laden job with 19 people from Saudi Arabia. They murdered 3,000 Americans and other farmers, including over 200 other Muslims, and we look like idiots, folks, denying that the people who murdered our fellow citizens did it when they are continuing to murder people all around the world. But, but you know, you're, see, this is the problem sometimes with the government. Hey, do we have some fucking security in this building? Or do I have to come over and pick this... As a number of practicing psychologists, psychiatrists, and counselors have explained, these responses are a natural defense mechanism when we are faced with something threatening to our worldview. So whenever we say, I refuse to believe, we can be sure that the evidence that's coming our way is not bearable and that it's, going, it's conflicting with our worldview much too much. Denial protects people from this kind of anxiety. As I thought about all of these responses, I realized that what is common to every one of them is the emotion of fear. People are afraid of being ostracized, they're afraid of being alienated, they're afraid of being shunned, they're afraid of their lives being inconvenienced, they'd have to change their lives, they're afraid of being confused, they're afraid of psychological deterioration, they're afraid of feeling helpless and vulnerable. And they're afraid that they won't be able to handle the feelings that are coming up. None of us want to feel helpless and vulnerable. So we want to defend ourselves. And the way we often do that is with anger. So then we become angry. And when we become angry, then we become indignant we become offended, we want to ridicule the messenger, we want to pathologize the messenger, and we want to censor the messenger. If these symptoms describe you or someone you know, you may be suffering from cognitive dissonance. Those suffering from such dissonance might be conditioned to expect some form of medication to be available to repress these symptoms, but this too is a lie that must be confronted. In truth, the only thing that can overcome this dissonance is to admit to yourself that you've been lied to and to inform yourself about those lies. For more information on the truth about 9-11, Big Pharma, the American police state, the NATO war agenda, Gladio B and false flag terror, and a range of other subjects that the public has been lied to about, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and visit BoilingFrogsPost.com. This has been a public service announcement from the Corbett Report, Confronting Cognitive Dissonance, one report at a time. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. Okay, well, I was going to have you uh, listen to another one from Ray McGovern talking about uh, Edward Snowden. And he was talking just a couple days ago, March 25th, at the, uh, uh, the press club. 
the National Press Club. He was a guest speaker. There were three or four people speaking on the same subject. I, th I recommend that you look that up. Well, I'm just going to say, uh, at the end of that last clip, we were talking about you know, people that had to go through the paradigm shift and how it was so terrifying to so many when they realized you know, what the implications of 9-11 being an inside job actually meant to their paradigm. Of, you know, it used to be America was the protector and Big Daddy never could do any wrong. Turns out that uh, you know, that's pretty much a lie and when people realize it, it's shocking. It shakes them to their core. Well, I was just asked, did I go through that type of thing when 9-11 happened? And, and somebody else asked me before that, you know, when did I become aware of 9-11? And I, I told them 1993, <laughs> when, when the FBI did the first bombing of the World Trade Center. I mean, but no, since my dad had told me about the Nazis taking over, and then we started learning about everything as time went by, the, the dirty tricks that our government did to get into Vietnam with the uh, Gulf of Tonkin ruse, the, the fraud of Gulf of Tonkin, and uh, of course the Liberty, the USS Liberty being shot all full of holes by the Israelis and President Johnson demanding that it be sunk to the bottom, and we just stay silent on that. Well. I already knew that there was no entity that protected or that fought for truth and justice except Superman and he was a fiction too. So I didn't go through that paradigm shift. I, I'm watching it and I wasn't cynical although uh, one thing I like about Jim Hightower, uh, he told the story about Lily Tomlin was once accused of being too cynical and she says yeah but no matter how cynical you are it's hard to keep up so anyway what it, what it boils down to is our country has long 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 ago uh, deviated from any path of decency and started supporting all the money interests and we're just kind of waking up as a country and beginning to realize that uh, we're getting a little more credibility as 9-11 truthers, protesters, whatever you want to call us, uh, because people are beginning to see that the, everything we've talked about is coming true in, in the form of pr the predictions that we've made about the economy and the power struggles and the use of Al-Qaeda. Look how they're using Al-Qaeda. Anytime they need to have an excuse to go in to invade somebody, we send in a fully armed Al-Qaeda. I think the whole purpose of all of this stuff is to make sure that the munitions people keep selling arms. Because no matter who's fighting whom, this, we sell the arms to both sides. Um, well, anyway, we've only got 47 seconds left and I want to remind you to uh, check the internet for Ray McGovern. Um, he was a 27-year veteran with the CIA. His job was to take all of the information that the CIA gathered every day and go through it and make a synopsis and then meet with the president and give him his presidential daily briefing. Remember the August, sec August 6th daily briefing, the one that said <laughs> Bin Laden planning to bring planes into, well, you know, virtually describing 9-11. Okay, we got to go, and I'll see you next Saturday. <laughs> I could talk forever, folks.